First John. First John, his epistle, chapter one. First John, chapter one. It's in the near the end of the New Testament, right before Second John. As if you couldn't guess. First John. And uh, the first three verses there of chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Parentheses. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The writer, the Apostle John, begins this general epistle to believers, much as he did his gospel, his record of Christ's birth, his life, his ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection, by highlighting the deity of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus is referred to as the Word of God. In the beginning, hearkening to Genesis, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The Gospel of John 1, verses 1 and 2. And later here, he writes in chapter 2, verse 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now, he's not saying you are the great Antichrist. But you're moving in that direction if you deny the deity of Christ. The Apostle John emphasizes the deity of the Lord Jesus more than any other writer in all the scriptures. He was consumed with it in his gospel, in his epistles, and in the book of Revelation. He wants to stress that aspect of Christ's identity. He was God in human form. And, and John also writes about himself as being that disciple whom Jesus loved. And he says that five times in his gospel. I'll give you those references if you're taking notes. John 13 Verse 23, John 19, verse 26, John 20, verse 2, John 21, verse 7, and John 21, verse 20. Now, the Lord Jesus loved all of his disciples, and John says as much. He writes, When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. John 13, verse 1. But Christ had a, a special affection for the Apostle John. That seems evident from John's writing and his re reference to himself. It was John who was seen leaning against the bosom of the Lord Jesus when they were reclined eating in the Last Supper in John 13. Uh, and that's not unusual in human relationships. You love your own children much more than you love the neighbor's kids. And you got nothing against the neighbor's kids. Um, let me ask you this. Does a mother love her children just as much as she loves her husband? In a good household, the answer would be yes. She loves them just as much as she loves him. But are those two loves identical? No, because of the relationship she has with them versus her relationship to him. And so it's not unusual for to read that John might have been identified as the disciple Jesus loved. That doesn't mean he automatically disloved or hated the others. But he was singled out, and he knew he was singled out. Perhaps he was more devoted to the Lord Jesus than the others. But the Bible says, Husbands, 
Love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5 verse 25. So in a way, the Apostle John is a great picture of the bride of Jesus Christ, the church, the collective body of all true believers. And if his emphasis was on the deity of Jesus Christ, then yours should be too. He insisted on it, and so should you. Last week, I preached about the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came into the world as a man, born into the world as a man, but without the fallen nature of men. Thank God for that. Um, but one thing today I want to stress, and that is I want us to, excuse me, I want us to zero in on the deity of Jesus Christ. If the Lord Jesus Christ was and is God who took on human form, or rather, if the Lord Jesus Christ was not and is not God who took on human form, then he was no different than any other prophet or historic figure who claimed to speak for God. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Maybe there were some better and some were worse. But if we call ourselves Bible believers, we don't want to know what the Bible means. And we don't want to know what the Bible teaches. We want to know what the Bible says. What does it actually say on the page? If we can agree with that, then the right meanings will follow. It's been said in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, the New Testament was concealed. In the New Testament, the old is revealed. You need them both. And we believe them both and we accept them both. So first of all, point number one, consider Christ's deity in the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah wrote, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Isaiah 9, verse 6. That first phrase, unto us a child is born, well, that would be his birth in Bethlehem. The second phrase, unto us a son is given, that was his title before he was ever born. The Lord Jesus Christ has always existed as the Son of God. The prophet Micah wrote, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting, Micah 5, verse 2. And uh, we would agree with the great high prayer given by Moses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. We don't worship three gods or a three-headed God like the JWs want to suggest. But... The New Testament doctrine of the Godhead, what they call the Trinity, shows how God has operated in his creation by revealing himself as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And just as sure as the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, Genesis 1 verse 2, the Son of God has been there from the beginning. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 45, book of Psalms. And Psalm 45, Psalm 45, and I want you to notice verses 6 and 7. It says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Well, if King David or the psalmist was addressing God, the heavenly father, Jehovah, well, then there could be no God but him. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Isaiah 44, 8 tells us. So David must have been addressing someone he called God beside God. 
Figure that one out for a moment if you can. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul clarifies that passage. He says, But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Quoting King David, Psalm 45. He said the Heavenly Father referred to the Son as God. Hebrews 1, verse 8. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, were all involved at the creation of, of the universe and the beginning of man. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1, 26. Who is God speaking to? The angels didn't do any of the creating. The same Son of God was present when the earth was formed and the universe was set in motion. Turn, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30. Notice there Proverbs 30 and verse 4. Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. Notice the clue in verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. The Lord Jesus Christ was present as the eternal Son of God in the Hebrew Scriptures a thousand, fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred years before Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. He was the deity of the Old Testament. Secondly, I want you to consider Christ's deity in the New Testament. This should be a given for those of us who are Called, who call ourselves Christians, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but the Lord Jesus is given the title of God numerous times. Before he was born in uh, Bethlehem, Matthew 1, 23 declared, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us, citing Isaiah 7, verse 14. He's called the Word by the Apostle John in the very first chapter of his gospel. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, verse 14. Now, Jesus Christ is the eternal God. He was God in the flesh because of the relationship of the Godhead, the, the Trinity, or the triune nature of the Godhead. The word Trinity is not found in our Bible, but the definition of the Godhead is certainly there. Cults reject it, and they say, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, so you can't, you know, latch on to that. You're, you're absolutely right. That word, spelled that way, Trinity, which means three in one, is not printed on the page of the Bible. But the definition is clearly there. I'll tell you something else. The word Bible isn't in the Bible. But I guarantee you there is such a book. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And in Acts 16, we read about the, the conversion of the Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16 and I'm going to begin reading there with verse 29. Acts 16, starting at verse 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. They believe on him, they'll be saved too. But notice verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is 
equated, it's defined as believing in God. Did you catch that? I want you to turn, if you will, to John chapter 8. We read in the Old Testament, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3, verse 14. God simply exists. There cannot be a sufficient or an adequate description of God. How do you describe the indescribable? How do you define the indefinable? That which has always been. But notice what Christ says in John 8, verses 23 and 24. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Notice their reaction, verse 59, Then took they up stones to cast at him, and so forth. To them it sounded like blasphemy, claiming God's title for himself. If someone says, I'm not a Christian, but I, I believe in God, that person doesn't really know God. Amen. They've never met him. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. The Bible says, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Romans 3, verse 4. And probably the most straightforward text in all the Bible. Old or New Testaments, on the deity of Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. I mentioned this last Sunday. Paul writes, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and then received up into glory. That verse has been twisted in every one of the modern translations. Jesus Christ has been the divine Son of God, the second member of the Godhead from all of eternity. To think that the creator of all known reality had to have existed even before reality as we perceive it could have come into being. It, it, your mind cannot fully comprehend it. You cannot fully process that possibility, that before, you see, we measure time based upon the movement of the sun, the moon, the earth, and the, the sunlight, moonlight, daytime hours as we know them. We count years based upon those movements, 365 and a quarter uh, days for a year. We did, had a leap day yesterday, February 29th, and we count years, we count months, we count weeks, we count hours, seconds, and so forth, based upon the creation uh, that we observe. Before the creation was there, how do you fully understand the being that put it there? <laughs> it's, it's difficult enough for us to process all of that with our minds, let alone go beyond that and describe something or someone that existed before anything existed. You and I could spend the rest of our lives trying to fully process that and never do it justice. But his full status may have been concealed in the Hebrew scriptures, but it was revealed for us in the New Testament. Thank God for that. Thirdly, I want you to consider Christ's deity between the two testaments. We read in Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. 
and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images, you know, pictures and statues and things made by man. Yet Christ prayed, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. John 17, verse 5. Now, if God doesn't give his glory to another, but he's willing to give it to Jesus Christ, then couldn't we logically conclude or deduce that Jesus Christ is a co-equal with the Father? Jesus Christ is God. Amen. King David wrote, Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Psalm 24, verse 10. The Apostle Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory suffered on the cross of Calvary for your sins and for my sins. Do you know him? Has there ever been a time in your own heart and in your own life and your mind where you'd say, God, I can't deny it. I know I'm a sinner. But if Jesus Christ died for my sake, I'm willing to trust him. And in the best way I know how, God, I'm asking you would save me. Forgive my sins. Grant me eternal life. Whatever is necessary, God, I'm, I'm begging you for it. Save my soul. Forgive me. When I was a little boy and I came forward here in this church to be saved, I remember two words of my sinner's prayer. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive. That's all I knew. That's all I said. I'd bawl my eyes out and music was playing and my dad probably, I don't know if he could even hear me saying that, but I was crying my eyes out. God, forgive me. And something happened right at that moment. It's been over 52 years now, and it's the most vivid memory of my early childhood. And I'm only 46 years old. So, but it's just as real in my mind uh, now as if it happened 52 years later, as, a, as if it had happened two weeks ago. That's how clear it is, and I hope it never fades. But... Um, Christ said, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. John 10, verses 30 and 31. I'm going to begin to bring this to a close for time's sake. The prophet Jonah said simply, Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah 2, verse 9. The prophet Isaiah recorded, I, even I, and the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 43, verse 11. The Apostle Peter said in the New Testament, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. The Bible says about Jesus Christ, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, verse 9. Christ told Thomas, uh, or Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He's all the Heavenly Father that you need to see. Amen. You recall when uh, Christ gave the, told the story of Lazarus and the rich man who both died, the rich man wakes up in hell and asks Abraham to send Lazarus to preach his five brothers that are still living, so lest they come to this place of torment. And he said, Son, if they hear that the Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one come to them from the dead. And you know the story. At least you should. Some people won't be converted no matter how many miracles were done right in front of them. They keep, all, they keep asking for one more proof, one more example, one more thing and I'll believe. One more act, and I'll believe. Show me one more thing. And you might change my mind. They like to play games. Acts 28, verse 24 says, Some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. 
It almost summarizes the entire Bible. One very succinct verse. Some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. But the eternal God took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. He lived among men. He walked among men. He can identify with men. But unlike men, he had no sin nature that needed to be cleansed away. He never committed a sin that deserved to be punished or needed to be forgiven. And therefore, living a perfect life that you and I could not live, he was qualified to die as a substitute for those of us who sin. That was the purpose of his death, to die on the cross of Calvary as a substitute for the sinner, as a sacrifice on behalf of the sinner. So that no other sacrifice now could even measure up to the death of Christ. Uh, in the Old Testament, men were commanded to bring a sacrifice to the priest. This is how God had instructed the Jews to live. You bring an animal to the priest, he'll sacrifice it on the altar, and uh, he prescribed the, the manner of each kind of, of offering, each kind of sacrifice, and so forth. And he took into account those who could afford a lamb or a bull or an oxen, uh, those who could not, turtle dove, and so forth. But the animal was not equal to the man in value. In fact, man had been given dominion over the animals, Genesis 1. But that was what God commanded. What man, and, and if he was obedient to it, it would get him as far as Abraham's bosom when he died, place of comfort. What man needed was a sacrifice equal and even greater than himself, so that no other sacrifice would ever be needed in the future. One sacrifice was sufficient to cover it all. And that sacrifice was the death of Jesus Christ, because he was eternal God. He was God from the beginning of time and uh, before that. He made all of reality, therefore he existed before reality. And as I say, you'll, you'll spend a lot of time trying to wrap your mind around that, but thank God for the deity of Jesus. Without that, we have nothing. Without Jesus Christ being absolutely God, 100% God, you and I have no hope. 